Hi there guys, my name's Quiva and today we're going to show you one of the many animals we work with in Eco Explorers. So today I'm here with Liam and what have you brought in to show us Liam? So today I've brought in a uh, blue tongue skink and this is Fluffy. Uh, blue tongue skink, they're native to uh, Australia, uh, New Guinea and Tasmania. Um, these guys, they're diurnal, so they're ground dwelling lizards as well. So they would spend most of their day in the morning, they would spend heating up, lying on rock, rocks, basking in the sun, and then the rest of the day they'd be hunting. Um, these particular guys, they'll eat snails, carrion, anything basically that's small and slow enough for them to catch. So Liam, why do they have blue tongues? Um, well the blue tongue is actually a defence mechanism. So usually in the animal world, uh, bright colours are usually an indication of a warning. So whether it's an indication that they're poisonous or that they're venomous um, or that they just don't taste good. Um, in the blue tongue skink's case, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but if he is threatened by a prey, it's an adaptation that he has. So he'll open his mouth, which is quite bright pink, uh, and he's a very, very deep blue tongue. Um, now what he will do is he'll push this out and inflate it, um, and he will hiss as well. Um, if this doesn't work, he has a couple of other adaptations as well. So even though they don't have well-defined teeth, they do have quite a strong bite. You can see they've got a quite powerful, a quite big and powerful jaws. But they also have, and I can show you here, um, they have a tail, uh, quite a big tail, but it's got predetermined fractures along the vertebrae. So if a prey does grab them, uh, the tail can actually detach. Um, this gives the, uh, the, the skink uh, just a moment to get away, um, and they can move quite quickly over short distances. But another adaptation as well, is that it can run backwards so it basically its hind legs can actually arch back on itself and it can run just as quick backwards as it can forwards and this is pretty good when they are burrowing at night if they do meet a predator like a snake or something else uh, they can turn and get out there pretty quickly um, are they good pets and are they hard to take care of uh, they make really good pets um, they're quite tame and they're easily ha easy to handle um, there is a few requirements you need uh, for keeping them in captivity. Uh, they need quite a big vivarium. It's usually about four foot long. Um, now they are burrowers and they like to dig, so they, you do need some soft soil that they can play around in. Um, as far as feeding them goes, in the wild they're omnivores, um, so they'll eat anything, in the shells, insects they can, uh, they can catch, to flowers and fruit and veg. So you try and replicate that in captivity as well. Uh, so it's a varied diet that they do need. Um, uh, I mean we. I myself would actually breed cockroaches and other insects oh, okay. at home just so it's, it's a bit cheaper and he, he will eat them um, but yeah anything from flowers to a little bit of chicken for protein um, oh, okay. but so it's easy to replicate their diet you could quite easily replicate their diet yeah oh, okay. uh, and a couple of the requirements they have is they do need a heat source um, because they're cold-blooded so that has to be provided as well but on the whole they're pretty they're pretty easy to keep as pets okay that's perfect so thanks a million for coming in to us today to tell us about Fluffy Liam. No problem. And up next we have Harry Walker interviewing Dr. Michelle Dugan. Hello, I'm Harry Walker and today I'll be interviewing Michelle Dugan who is a part-time lecturer here at the university, NUIG. Um, he was a keen interest in venomous and poisonous animals. He's also a presenter on the RT Junior show Bulk Hunters and he's the founder of the outreach program Eco Explorers. So Michelle, what got you interested in venomous and poisonous creatures? Well, when I was a child uh, in my village where I grew up in France, we used to have fairs during the spring and during the summers. And there was an old entomologist, probably in his 70s, and I was six or seven years old, who would come with all these insects at all these fairs. And I was absolutely fascinated by all these animals. And I remember that one day, for my birthday, my mum actually bought me a dead scorpion from that entomologist, and it was probably the best present ever. Ah. So what's the difference between a venomous and a poisonous animal then? Venom and poison are two different things. Venom is a toxic product that is produced by an animal in a particular organ and it is delivered into a prey or a potential enemy via a very sharp device. The fangs of a snake, uh, the fangs of a spider or the sting of a scorpion, uh, the barb of a fish uh, or the pinchers of a centipede. While poison is a product that is produced by a plant or an animal 
and that is toxic when ingested. So frogs, for example, can be poisonous, but they do not inject the, the poison. They are effectively non-venomous, but poisonous. Dangerous only if you swallow them or if you enter in contact with them. Wow, okay, that's good to clear that up. Um, so, and Eco Explorers, so what, what made you start Eco Explorers? So Eco Explorer started in 2012-2013 uh, as a new science outreach uh, initiative. I used to teach undergraduate students um, arthropod biology here at NUI Goldway and I realized that actually there was still a lot to do on education about arthropods, bugs, reptiles and I thought that it would be a good idea to actually go to primary school and secondary school and undo some of the urban myth about snakes, spiders, scorpions, tarantulas. So this is how Eco Explorer started. And how did you get involved with NUIG? Well, originally, many years ago, I was a language teacher in Southeast Asia. I was teaching French and linguistics. And my hobby was actually to collect uh, venomous snakes. And uh, after a few years, I actually left the Alliance Française in Malaysia, where I was working, to take over a reptile park dealing with venomous animals. And uh, while living in rural areas of Malaysia, I actually discovered new species of snakes and lizards. And uh, I called scientists from the Bangor University in North Wales to actually come and describe them. And those scientists invited me to do a Master's of uh, Ecology at Bangor University, which I did, and uh, I got it with distinction. And after that, I started a PhD uh, over here at NUI Galway. I did my PhD and I started to work as a postdoc um, researcher over here. And after my postdoc contract, I started to do science outreach and part-time lecturing. Wow, that's a big journey. And so what, what were you doing for your PhD then? Well, my PhD was investigating the evolution and development of the venom system of giant centipedes. Giant centipedes. And what's the difference between mm. giant centipedes and any any regular kind of centipedes? Other than the well, giant size. centipedes actually belong to a particular order called the Scolopendromorpha. Yeah. You can find centipedes in your garden, and they're going to measure anywhere between one centimeter and four centimeters. But Scolopendromorpha can measure up to 30, 35 centimeters over a foot long, and they have a very developed and very potent uh, venom system and venom. So it was very interesting to actually investigate how a venomous animal develops the venom glands, the fangs, and then how potent is the venom and how that venom is used by the animal during hunting or predation. Okay. Yeah, because you use the word hunt in there, and I usually associate that with, with larger animals, but of course insects go on the hunt as well, and they're... All arthropods that are all predators would go hunting in that sense. A predator must hunt down and kill other animals in order to survive. So this is their main mission, their main uh, role in life, and they do that amazingly well. So it is always fascinating to actually study how a predator has adapted to this new hunting method and new prey, or prey that continuously evolve to try and avoid predator. Yeah, yeah, because it does seem like there's a there's a lot of a there's a struggle, there's a constant arms race between them. There is a constant arm race between the prey and the predator. As a predator kills prey. Prey that survive usually have a particular advantage, a new method to actually survive. They are better than others, and this is why they manage to live longer, reproduce, and pass down these abilities to survive better to the pred uh, to the to predation to their offspring. So, meanwhile, the predator, in response, has to adapt as well, has to adapt to these prey that are continuously getting better and better at avoiding predator. So that constant arm race is a very dynamic movement and a fascinating subject to study. Yeah. So any 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 weak weak links in the chain, any weak animals in the chain are picked off by by the top predators and absolutely this yeah. is what we call natural selection. It is a core principle of Darwinism and the theory of evolution. 